Hey guys, welcome back. Good evening. Where are you? Wherever you're tuning in from, uh, Jeb Smith and Josh Lewis, we're back to talk about the real estate market, talk about housing, talk about mortgages, interest rates, mortgage forbearance, foreclosures, evictions, really anything you want to talk about. Clearly, there's a lot going on in the news today. Um, you know, so maybe you could take a break and join us from that, but we can talk about, you know, what's happening in the Senate how that might affect housing. Um, today, we got some news that, uh, you know, the um, 10 year, um, which, you know, interest rates aren't based on the 10 year, but, you know, they kind of follow a trend there and it closed above 1% for the first time in, in quite some time. So we're going to throw it to Josh here in just a minute to talk more about that. But know that, you know, as I always say, we're here to answer your questions. That's why we show up um, each and every week is to address your questions about housing. So do us a favor and throw them in there and we'll, uh, and we'll, you know, we'll get to them. So let's start Josh talking about interest rates. We've been talking about them for, I don't know, the last eight to nine months on some sort of consistency about what we expect. Right. So today some things happened that I think, you know, were surprising to some extent. Um, and, how do we think that's going to play out over the next couple of weeks to months? I mean, I'm reading articles that are, you know, getting published as of today saying, you know, refinancing is dead. Rates are going to go up from here. So I'll throw it to you. The funny thing is um, you've seen those things where someone gives you like three or four media quotes and they go, see, and, you know, this is what someone predicted. And then here's where we're at. And they go, well, that quote was from 1954. Or, or, and, and that's what I feel like. If you go back with mortgage stuff, um, I was looking at, um, at a website about lake properties in Texas. Draw your own conclusion as to why someone may be doing that. But I was looking at properties on lake in Texas and the article was from like 2014. And they were saying the same things in there that, you know, we're seeing a lot of sales because rates um, are as low as they're ever going to be and people buying down their rates and getting, you know, if you get three and a half, it's never going lower than that. So we've seen a lot of that. We saw it in the summer, people saying, hey, pay points, buy down your rate, you get the, the greatest rate ever, and now they're lower. So if we go back all the way to 1982, we're in a 38, 39 year um, bull run in interest rates, meaning interest rates continue to go lower. Um, anything happening now is not going to break us out of that trend. Um, I'm on record. I will say it again. I think rates are going lower. It doesn't mean that I think they're going lower next month, in six months, or even two years. I'm saying just like in 2013, 2014, people thought those were the greatest rates we were ever going to see, and we ended up at something insane that no one ever thought possible. And people are saying the same things now. There's a floor on interest rates. Lenders won't lend if rates go below a certain level. And there may be, um, but it's probably closer to 1% than it is to the current two and three quarters-ish where people are at. So what does that mean? What have we seen today? Um, the, the big news is the 10 year, the 10 year has done worse than mortgage. So one of the things that you said is the 10 year treasury does not directly impact mortgage rates, but is a very good proxy for mortgage rates because the two, um, they will vary to different degrees over time, but it's sort of like they're, they're, they have a, your dog is at the end of a leash. Your dog can only go so far. It's going to stay fairly close. So your mortgage rates are going to stay fairly close to the 10 year. So mortgages have done better in the short run. So over the last week or so, we had talked, um, you know, 10 days or so ago, we did a video and talked about rates were being at their best level ever. Well, on Monday, rates were at their best level ever. So we had seen about a 50 basis point improvement last week in really low trading. When you get these weeks between Christmas and New Year's, when there's not a lot of people in right. Chicago trading bonds, you get weird movements. So we saw about a 50 basis point improvement last week, 30, 40, 50 basis points, and we gave it all back the last two days. So in the grand scheme of things, rates are about where they were last week, maybe an eighth worse. But what we saw with the 10 year breaching 1%, um, it, it's just an important psychological level. We had never really been below 1% until coronavirus broke out. Right. So in March, we fell below one, went all the way down for a couple of days to like 0.3%, just really, really, really low levels. But We've been between like 0.6 and 1, uh, 0.6 and 0.95 for the better part of six months. So being above 1% today is important, but only important if we see a follow through tomorrow. You need confirmation. One day can be an aberration. So if we right. come in tomorrow and they stay up at that level and push higher, um, we could absolutely see a move higher. I don't think this means that rates are going a lot higher. I don't think we're going to see rates over 3% in the near term. But when we have a movement like today, the important thing to look at is 
don't ever get excited by the movement in one trading day or one piece of news and let it right. get emotional and take you one direction or the other. So no matter what, for, forget the craziness that happened in Washington, D.C. today. Say the election in Georgia. Either you woke up this morning and you were stoked that you won two seats or you were stoked that you lost two or you were unhappy that you lost two seats. Either yeah, I don't way, think they were stoked that they, they lost weren't stoked. two seats. They weren't stoked they lost two. So either way, the that it really doesn't impact us nearly as much as what you think people right. will make it into. So if you thought it was great, it's probably not going to be that great for you personally to make that big of a difference. If you thought it was terrible, we'll get into it, but it's probably not going to make that big of a difference. We're now to 50, 50. It's very rare that you're able to keep all 50 of your delegates in line and get them to vote one way where it would go to uh, vice president Harris for a, a tiebreaker. So just using it as an example, be calm. Don't be emotional that we see one day. Um, this could be a situation where we never see a 10-year treasury below 1%. Again, I don't think that's the case. But as an example, I mean, Jeb and I are pretty smart. We've done this a long time. We watch this stuff. But there's people way, way smarter than, than me. I subscribe to a lot of them. I pay for their information and I read it. So two things that showed up in my mailbox or inbox this week uh, on Monday, guy saying rates are going to go negative. And he adds, writes a five page letter about here's wow. all of the things going on worldwide, globally, that's going to push U.S. Na rates negative, which would be a percent lower than where we're at right now. And then yesterday, another one pops in and this guy goes, hyperinflation is coming. Another really smart guy. These aren't crackpots. These are very smart guys. And again, another four or five pages of really well-reasoned arguments of why rates are going higher. Um, I kind of think they're both wrong and we're going to see a lot more of the same. But at the end of the day, um, if you want or need to refinance, do it now because we have that certainty. We know where our rates are. We've locked in seven or eight clients in the last two days um, that probably got a little spooked and said, hey, instead of hoping, praying that I get another eighth lower, let me make sure I get something with a 2% handle on it versus ending up with a three or a 3.125. So that would be the, the big advice. I mean, as of today, um, we just locked a client at 2.75. Two days ago, we locked a similar client at 2.625, someone who actually came through the, the YouTube video. Um, and and uh, we were able to get her in the perfect day. It's a low loan to value, super high credit score, easy file. So that was your perfect best case scenario. And that perfect best case scenario today is 2.75. At the end of the day, once you get your loan, no one remembers their interest rate. When I talk to a borrower for the first time, when we're talking about refinance, what's your current interest rate? Well, I think it's three and a half or maybe it's 3.625. I'm not sure. So the only time you care about your interest rate is the day you lock it and the day you sign your loan docs. And the difference between an eighth here, higher or lower, doesn't matter over time. Just know rates are excellent and likely to continue to be excellent. Though, um, you know, if I were to guess, I, I would think we're going to be plus or minus three percent ish. So if you tell me that in six months we're closing loans at three and an eighth, three and a quarter, that wouldn't shock me. And depending on where you're at, based on the size of your loan, it can make a healthy difference in your monthly payment. Whether that's $70, $200, $250, it's a big difference. No, I understood. So uh, in layman's terms, I think, you know, Josh, getting out of treasuries and talking about all that, interest rates aren't really going anywhere in the short term, regardless of what you saw today. Um, just, you know, you, you got to keep, you know, we're doing this once a week, right? Rates aren't going to go up so much in the next time that we do this or that I do this, that, you know, there's going to be some huge shocker in the market, but you know, you know what the rates are now. If you need to lock in, now's the time to do it. Uh, but I think you, you talked about something important there that that's worth addressing. And that is, you know, the Senate, right? So the Senate is going to essentially confirm both uh, seats today, going to be democratic. Um, so you're going to have a you know, 50 um, Republicans, 50 Democrats in the Senate and the tiebreaker, if you will, once you have a tie, it goes to the vice president. In this case, Kamala Harris, Democratic. So the Democrats essentially have the majority in the Senate if they all vote the exact same way. So the question a lot of people have is how is this going to affect housing? How is this going to affect, you know, policies and that sort of thing? And neither of us are, you know, politicians or really in the political scene by any means. Uh, but I think, you know, before we got on this, I think we were both thinking along this, the same way. And you even mentioned it is that, you know, in order for them to really have an effect in the Senate, you've got to have all 50 of, you know, the Democrats vote the exact same way. And as we mentioned, there's four or five of them that are in red states that aren't just going to be able to go with the flow and, and vote along those, those lines. Um, 
just to, to give their vote to to the Democrats. So there's going to have to be some balance on that side. There's going to have to be people working together to make things happen. Now, we don't really know what that means at this point, but you know, there are some policies out there that um, that we've heard of that that Biden wants to to pass for for home buyers and what have you. And why we don't have a lot of information on it, you know, the fact that they have some sort of control may mean that that that's a you know a more plausible thing that could happen. Um, but more importantly, I think what you'll see is you could probably see additional stimulus. You could probably see additional things to help people out over the next six months or so. Um, it might be rental assistance. It might be extensions on forbearance. It might be different things, eviction and foreclosure moratorium extensions, just because, you know, that, that's kind of the way that that they've been leaning. And, and I think you, you might see more of that. Thoughts on that, Josh? No, absolutely. And I would think, what what does it prevent? What does that type of a 50-50 tie split prevent? It prevents anything that's crazy far left from going through. Because those four or five moderate um, Democrats, Democrats in red states, they're not going to go along with something crazy. Right. Now, things that are pretty much party line that all Democrats agree on, yeah, you probably get 50 of them to line up for it. But again, it's not the extreme stuff. And that's the big worry, not just for conservatives and Republicans. It's the big worry for markets. Markets like um, vanilla. They like middle of the road. So as long as we don't have any extreme left, extreme right, weird stuff, and it's somewhat center, centrist, moderate policies, um, the, the markets are going to be fine with it. So I, I wouldn't read too much into it. You know, we had some weird stuff in 2016 when when Trump won. Um, he came in promising, I'm, I'm cutting taxes, I'm doing a number of things, and markets did really well because everything that he was saying was really pro-business. But it hurt interest rates because people were were just concerned that we would have inflation with with the economy doing really well, people having money spending. Um, so you can see weird stuff. Um, I would expect that we're going to see a, a kind of a slow start to the administration, first hundred days of the year, and you, you got to just remember that markets are always trying to they like they dis they like certainty and dislike uncertainty. We still have a lot of uncertainty. We have political experts and talking heads, way too many. Whatever your preferred way channel of cable many. news is, we've got way too many. But no one knows. Um, no one knows what's going to happen. I don't think any crazy ultra left policies are going to get through. We're certainly going to see different policies and different things um, than the, the last four years. Um, and maybe, hopefully, uh, we had four years of crazy this way, we get four years of crazy this way, maybe everyone will be able to vote for uh, someone in, in the middle that most of us can agree on and be be happy with four years from now. Yeah, good luck with that. So uh, <laughs> I can we, got dream. People, we got some people joining here. Um, Eric is saying hello. Hello, Eric. Uh, Liz saying she made it. Uh, welcome, Liz. Um, uh, with Alex, I believe Alex. Is this Alex? Appreciate info, fellas. Thanks for joining. And Moonlight Sunrise was here last time. So appreciate you coming back. So um, actually has a question. Will there be any housing correction in the near future, specifically for new constructions? Also, do you see the mortgage interest rates increase in the future? So Josh talked about rates. Housing, I don't see going anywhere anytime soon. Again, we're, we, you know, we've talked about supply and demand way too many times. I've done way too many videos on it, um, more than I ever wanted to do, talking about you know, the housing market and, um, you know, you're not going to see any sudden changes in the market at the moment. I, you know, there's just too much, again, uncertainty, right? There's too many people that don't know what's going on, whether it's virus related or something else. Uh, you can imagine that, that you have an older family right now that wants to sell their house, but they're in a place where the virus is, is rampant and, and hospitals are full and, and that sort of thing. Those people aren't going to sell their house during this time because of that. So you've got that, you know, those homes just out there. Who knows when they're going to come to the market? Then you've got all of these people that just refinanced into rates that they never seen in their lifetime. So now their mortgage payment is less than it's ever been. So now those people are like, hey, I'm pretty comfortable here. You know, I don't really need to sell my house. There's not really a lot out there. I really like it here. I raised my kids here. They're not going to sell. And so you know, you've just got all of these different factors playing into the market, which yes, there are foreclosures out there. Yes, there are these moratoriums that are going to come due, but understand that not every single one of those is going to turn into something negative. There's, you know, 
you're going to have, I think with Democrats being in office, you're probably going to have a lot more help um, on, on some of those uh you know, items than 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 maybe on on the Republican side. I don't know. Um, clearly, just taking a stab at that. But um, you know, new construction is one of those things. If you looked at the last report that came out, um, I think what it was down eleven percent in in December. But if you had followed the trend lines from from six months before that, it had been above the trend line or the expectations. It, it far exceeded it month over month over month. In December, it just kind of came back in line with. Yeah, it was below expectations, but if you looked at the trend, it just basically came back to the trend. And so historically, December, you know, November, December, January are slow months in real estate. This year is not going to be any different. In fact, you're probably going to see a little bit more of it just because of the pandemic, but it's going to pick back up. Um, interest rates are likely going to stay low. Like we said, supply is still a really, really big issue. I mean, I talked about this the other day in Huntington Beach, 205,000 people you know, where we live, give or take, you know, a couple thousand, we have 140 active homes on the market. One, four, zero. That is nuts. So That's they, counting condo, condos, townhomes, and single family residences. That well, is they, insane. Again, all real estate is local, but the numbers, everyone has very similar numbers in their market. So for us, you're talking Huntington Beach numbers, Orange County wide. Last year, start of 2000, we only had 3,692 homes on the market. It was the lowest level in 16 years. You're like, wow, we have no supply. This year, we're starting with 2,675. Yep. Like there's, there's, no, there's no precedent for that until you go back to the 60s or the 70s when there were half as many people in Orange County. So there's, there's a ton of demand still and less and less supply. And one thing that people don't don't think of, you hear this argument that, hey, rates rates go up and that'll slow demand. We'll get into more supply demand balance. Well, imagine anyone who's keeping their home is probably in a two, seven, five mortgage. Now, if rates go up to three and a half, do you think they're eager to put their house on the market and go buy a more expensive home or a new home at three and a half? It will be another constraint on supply if rates go up because people will be less willing than ever to move out of their, their wonderful interest rate. So the supply and demand imbalance is not going anywhere. The demographics of the country tell us that's going to be a problem. That and you have, you know, people that, you know, there's there's millennials now moving back home to live with families. So those families that had the large homes that need to were thinking of selling them and downsizing, guess what? They're not thinking that anymore because now they've got kids back home. Um, you know, there's just way too many factors playing into different things. And we've talked about it. I mean, we've talked about, you know, people, companies now allowing you to work virtually, right? So you no longer have to drive into the office. You know, I if you worked in LA, you could have lived 45 minutes around LA, drove in every day. Guess what? Those people can now live in Texas if they want to live in Texas. And, and a lot of them have. And so it's causing markets that haven't appreciated in 20 years to, you know, appreciate at levels they've never even thought of, um, which is putting supply issues and and on, on, you know, other areas. It's just, it's not just Southern California. While, you know, a lot of what I talk about is Southern California, it's really an issue everywhere and you're likely going to continue to see it. Now, will there be markets that that don't, um, you know, grow as 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 fast as others? Of course, of course there is. I mean, there are going to be issues at some point there. But, you, you know, when you buy real estate, one thing you have, you know, it, it's location, location, location. Right. Southern California is very, very desirable for many, many reasons. Um, and, and so people will always continue to, to live here, you know, Texas, Austin, some of these places, there are going to be people that always want to live there. So, you know, just make sure when you're making your decision to buy somewhere that you're, you're, you know, throwing these factors into it. It's, you know, it's nobody knows what's going to happen, but I think if, if you look at the, the fundamentals of what is driving this, it's not, we already came into this year with low supply. It, the pandemic didn't create the low supply. I mean, Josh mentioned a minute ago. Our market had 3,000 homes. This year we have 2,600. Yeah, I mean, that's what, a 10% drop. But, you know, I mean, in the grand scheme of things, that's not that big of a deal. I mean, it's, I don't know. So you can add to that, Josh, if you want. I kind of went off on a tangent there. No, the only thing I would say, because we do have a lot of people here from different parts of the country, yeah. what you're seeing, the the areas that are going away and not coming back and you're not seeing participate in this boom are rural, more small towns areas um it's almost like if your area is big enough to have big box stores there's there, that's enough as people say hey 
I can't afford to live in the city center or even the, the nearby suburb that the prices are so high, but I can still have my favorite restaurants. I have my Costco. I have everything within 20, 30 minutes. Those areas are growing and expanding and, and doing well. So it's not that every area is going to do well, but you mentioned all these areas. I was I, I have a Toyota Tundra. So I was in the Tundra forum the other night. These guys were talking, dude, it just moved to Boise and it blew his mind. They'd written like 14 offers and almost everyone was sold before they got their offer over. I mean, and he's writing them immediately and they're sorry, we got it under contract and it was 50,000 over list price. Dude, this is wild. So I was, uh, you know, I network with a lot of real estate agents across the country, was in a forum. I put this on my my YouTube page a couple of days ago. Um, I was in a, you know, in a, in a Zoom chat and, you know, we all network and mastermind together. A uh, guy in Austin, Texas, property, $500,000 property. He said it was priced at fair market value, what it should have been priced at, had 90 offers nine zero and i'm like how like what do you even do <laughs> like what do you do with that you yeah. just tell the stuff like i can't even present all these things i mean it just insanity so and, and then um, one of the things jeb that's really unfortunate and no one asked this question but let's answer a question that no one asked what happens <laughs> in that situation with the appraisal so when you got to understand what an appraiser's job is, he's supposed to go out and he's supposed to look for comparable homes and see what they sold for. Well, when each one goes for 5%, 7% higher than the last one, what do they do? There's nothing around there to support it. But you have a stack of 90 right. offers that say, this is where the market is at. So a real estate agent, a seller knows I'm going to have a problem with my appraisal. If I take the FHA buyer, the VA buyer, the 5% down conventional buyer. So you get this self-fulfilling prophecy where you have to sell to someone with a big down payment or cash. So it's just a really weird market where the people that you would love to sell to, that you would love to get in the market, unless you're super confident you're going to be able to get that appraise, that property to appraise, um, it, it's hard to sell with them, sell to them with confidence and know that you're going to be able to have your sale go through at the value they agreed to pay, even though they're, they would be happy to pay it. No, that, that's definitely a problem. And we can elaborate on that more here. I want to get to some of these questions. Um, so Liz is asking, do you know about Homestead? We are closing at the end of this month and we also refinanced our house a few months ago, which we will rent out once we close. Can we apply it on the new house right away? Um, yeah. I, I mean, my understanding is yes. Um, I, I'm not sure where you're located, Liz, but Josh, jump on that. I mean, well, we just got, they just increased the numbers massively here in California. Our homestead here in California was so tiny, it was kind of pointless. Um, and I don't have the numbers in front of me, but it was a, a big, big, big increase. And the homestead, what it basically does is if you ever get into financial trouble, it allows you to protect some of, of your home equity right. um, in, in bankruptcy proceedings. It just protects it from creditors. So yeah, you should be able to move it to your new primary residence fairly quickly. And as a Jeb said, it depends on where you're at in the country, how much you can protect and, and how exactly it gets applied. Yeah, I, I wasn't even sure if you could keep the one on your current house and have another. I, I if if you can have it on multiple properties, I'm I'm not really I understand it, but I'm not super familiar with it just because we don't really encounter it so much. Um, so sorry, Liz, not not much help there. Sam's hello, Jennifer saying hello. Um, just discovered the channel and loves it. Appreciate it. So uh, Super Mario Bronze Moran, Miranda. I'm getting ready to buy a new house, a home in Houston, two story, 2800, blah, 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 for 350. What's your opinion on this? I don't mind getting a hardcore raw opinion. I mean, it's hard for Josh and I to give you an opinion on what's happening in Houston, right? Because we're in Southern California, entirely different markets. Um, you know, I would, like I would tell anybody out here, I mean, you know, hopefully with new construction, I don't know if you're buying, if you're working with an agent or you're working with the, the, the builder themselves, if you're buying new construction, it's always a good idea to have a real estate agent separate from the builder for, for many, many reasons. Um, but you know, more importantly, you know, new construction typically sells for whatever they have it valued at in most markets. I mean, these guys are pretty good with pricing homes. Um, they do a lot of forecast. They have an idea of what properties are worth. So typically their, their pricing is pretty close to what the homes are worth until you start adding upgrades, which is a complete ripoff. But that's a whole different, um, you know, conversation. So I would say that at 350, it's probably priced right. I mean, I would love to buy a 2800 house, uh, square foot <laughs> house, five bedrooms for 350. So, you know, if I were judging it from California, I would say, dude, that's the best deal in town. But I realize you're in Houston. So, you know, again, if you're what you have to focus on is time horizon, right? How long do you plan on being there? 
Are you early in development? Are you late in the development? The earlier you are, the better off you're probably going to be uh, with, with them building out that development. Um, but if you plan on being there for some period of time, you're comfortable with the payment, you're not fully extending yourself, yeah, you're probably in good shape. Um, but you know, in, in Houston, you obviously have a flooding problem there. I've, I've seen that. So make sure that you know you're not in um, in, in that kind of uh, um, situation. Uh, but yeah, it, it's hard to say. I mean, you know, because we're in a, an entirely different market. But I would say just you know, um, you know, if you're comfortable, then then I don't think you're the, the market isn't going to change enough in the next couple of years in my opinion, for it to be a problem. So if that's your your worry, then I think you're good. Other than that, it's hard to say. All right. So Hydros, Hydros 77, Hydros. It's like a crazy caravan going to each house as it comes up over bidding, fest begins, totally nuts in the Dallas area. So, you know, what I've talked about on, on videos and, and what I've encountered is, Say, for example, you have a, a property in a in a community and it's priced right. And, um, you know, there's five or six offers on that property just just being, you know, on the low side of, of, of number of offers. What happens is when that property goes into escrow and the next property comes up in that neighborhood. Guess what? The four people that didn't get that property are all now moving to the new property along with any new buyers that came in 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 that um, in that equation or came to market or whatever. So what you have is you have a lot of people all looking for the exact same thing, regardless of where you are. I mean, you're in Dallas. We're seeing the same thing here in Southern California. That's why, you know, when I do these videos and talk about rates and finance and what you should be doing to prepare yourself outside of being patient, the first thing is making sure that you have your ducks in a row, not a prequal. You, you haven't done some online form that tells you that, hey, yeah, you're, you know, you can get this amount. You need to have somebody pull your credit. You need to provide your tax returns. You need to provide bank statements, everything, right? And let a lender fully pre-approve you so that you have a full pre-approval letter so that when that property does come on the market, because it will, you're ready. Because what I see more often than not is somebody sitting on the sidelines you know, maybe they haven't even told me that they're interested. Maybe they're a past client. They're looking at buying a property. They haven't even told me. And then the property comes on the market. They call me and they say, hey, Jeb, I want to write an offer. Have you been pre-approved? No, I haven't done that yet. I, I just wanted to wait to see if the property came up. That's a problem. So, you know, in this market where you're going to see things move very, very fast, a lot of people are predicting 2021 to be even a faster moving market than 2020. I don't know how that's possible, but uh, if that's the case, you need to... Uh, to, to jump on it and, and make sure you're you're doing the right things up front. So, Jeb, look, look at this. So here's another question from Alejandro Montero. How would you get creative when making an offer in San Diego to get your offer accepted? And that can be San Diego. We just learned it can be Dallas. It can be Boise, probably the same uh, in, in Houston as well. Almost every market, people are asking the same question. So one of the things that you talked about, like if you are getting financing, if you're not one of those lucky people that's a cash buyer or putting 50% down, if you're getting financing, get with your lender up front and have a rock solid full loan approval. All of your income docs, all of your asset docs, your credit in line, what that does. So when Jeb has a client that we're working with and he gets ready to write an offer, he puts together a strong offer package with a good cover letter over to the agent who he's talked to and had a conversation. And this doesn't guarantee anything, but it's the start of that relationship of letting the other realtor know that this is a trustworthy professional that you're going to be working with and this deal is going to close and you're not going to have a hard time and someone you know not responding or doing crazy things. That's step number one. But because we have a full package, he copies me on the email when that offer goes over. I'm going to immediately reach out with a phone call to them. Tell them the same thing. Hey, this is me. This is who I am. This is how long I've been in the business. Check my Google reviews. You'll know who I am. I am telling you that this client is a great client. Here's all of the good things. If you think you have a better offer or a better borrower, you don't. Mine are the greatest. They're incredibly fantastic. And if they don't pick up, because they're that same person in Austin that has 90 offers and they can't respond to everyone. I'm going to put a video in their email inbox telling them the same thing, putting a face to a name, showing them who my team is, because those are little things that 
if there's 90 offers, only one out of those 90 is going to win. But probably only eight or 10 of them come across with that type of strength from the realtor, from the loan officer showing this is a team that you want to work with. So that's one of the hacks or the tools that I tell people all the time. And the, it was funny, the guy in the forum that was saying he was in Boise, he said, um, you know, I'm, I'm working with a friend of mine. He recently got his real estate license, but he goes to tell him he's got an MBA. He's a really smart guy. And what I told him, I said, I don't care how smart your friend is in a market like this, 30, 40, 50% of the homes are selling among agents that know each other. 100%. That thing doesn't even hit the market. You, you talk about your mastermind that you're either in Facebook groups with or your office meeting or your broker caravan. You know what your friends are looking for. Um, and it's not a matter of trying to keep something off market. It's how do we get a, a transaction put together to get a good number for my seller with a group of professionals that's going to get everyone to the to the finish line. So yeah. it's important to work with someone that's not only a good realtor, but has been at it a while and has a big network because that network is making as many deals happen as the MLS is right now. No, for sure. And, and I'm going to add to that, Alejandro. I'm going to actually give you some creative things that you can do. Um, and there's not a lot, right? I mean, it, it really comes down. I mean, as, a, as somebody that helps a lot of sellers, um, a listing agent, you know, you sellers typically care about price. I mean, that's, you know, as much as they care about the family that's coming in to live in their home or, or whatever, most people care about the dollar sign, but there are those people out there that do care, um, about, you know, the people moving into their house, their neighborhood, what have you. So there's a couple of creative things you can do. You know, the most creative, I mean, not really creative at this point because a lot of people are doing it, but we were doing it prior to it being a thing is an escalation clause. So you can write an offer that, you know, that you're willing to go a thousand dollars above the highest offer up to X amount, right? When writing your offer, that can be part of your offer and you can request proof of the highest offer so that, you know, you're not overpaying or what have you, or, or just getting bamboozled, if you will. But that allows you to be in the game to some extent, but you've got to be willing to play that game, right? I mean, everybody says, well, I, you know, I just don't, I don't want to pay more than the asking price. Well, then this market's probably not for you if the house is priced right. Outside of that, it's tough. Like I used to tell people to write the love letter to the seller, that sort of thing. Now with fair housing this year, they just came out with um, something that says basically can't do that anymore, um, which is garbage. But there are ways around that, right? I mean, typically what happens is once you throw a photo into uh, one of these love letters, it becomes you know, something more than just a letter, right? Because people can judge people based on appearance, ethnicity, and all of that. So if you keep that out of the letter, there's not really any violations to fair housing um, because you're just telling the seller what you love about the property um, and, and, and maybe describing a little bit about who you are, right? You're not, there's not really any violations there. So talk to your agent in San Diego, find out what you can do, what they're comfortable doing um, with writing those because that stuff helps stand out. Um, you know, I, I've had clients do do videos um, in, in the property uh, of, of them, you know, walking around the property with their kids playing in the backyard, that sort of thing. That stuff sticks out. I'm not sure how fair housing is going to play into all of that. Um, and, and it really just depends on what the seller is comfortable with. You've got to, you know, as a listing agent, when I have a property for sale, one of the questions is going to be, are you comfortable with with agents giving me letters? Are you comfortable with me sending those to you? And if they say yes, they're the seller, I'm going to send them over and let them make the decision on, on how they want to approach it. But another thing your agent can do is ask to, to sit down with the seller. Hey, you want they, I want to present my client's offer in person. That way you can show up as a professional, assuming your, your agent's a professional, and, and hopefully they are, they can present these things in person. They can maybe show up with you and, and present the offer in person to help you stand out and show, hey, look, I'm a professional agent. My clients here, they're well qualified. They have all the proper documentation. You know, we just wanted to sit in front of you and, and, and actually show you we're serious. Those types of things. That's how you can stand out in a market like this. But again, it takes two parties to uh, to work together to do that. And, you know, in, in this type of market, depending on who's a on the other side, you might not always have the opportunity to do that, right? I mean, in a market where housing and, and real estate and mortgage does very, very well, you've got a lot of yahoos in the business, unfortunately, that um, make things difficult for everyone. And it's probably only going to get worse. So 
Um, I'm going to go back here and address a couple of questions, Josh. So, um, Carl, buying my father's house in North OC, pretty original home from the 70s. Would it be better to go for 20% down or 15% down with some money for renovations? So, do you want to jump on that, Josh? Well, the, the big difference you're going to see from 20 to 15, people don't understand that you will actually get a slightly better rate or a lower cost for the rate at 15% down than 20. Uh, and it sounds crazy because you're like, doesn't the lender want me to put more down? And the answer is actually no, because the mortgage insurance that you're going to be required with the 15% down gives them more coverage. Your 15% down plus the mortgage insurance coverage makes it a more secure loan for them. So you would get slightly better terms. Um, but you'll pay mortgage insurance. It'll increase the payment slightly. It really comes down to, do you have other ways to finance those improvements? Because the reality is, we just had a client right now that made the decision for a different reason to go just um, to refinance at just over 80% uh, loan to value versus bringing in some money to be at 80%. We looked at his neighborhood. We knew what he's working on with his house right now. Said so after 12 months, you can get a new appraisal and petition the uh, lender to remove the mortgage insurance. So if rates go up or stay flat and we can't do a, a refinance next year, he can do that and get rid of the mortgage insurance. You could do the same in this situation. So um, we we know that uh, an older dated home that's going to get updated is going to appraise for more than what it would be worth right now. So I would lean towards keeping some money back, um, using that to finance the repairs and look at either removing the mortgage insurance next year when the value goes up or if rates are the same or slide even lower, you can look at refinancing to a lower rate, which kind of goes back to the things you know that Jeb uh, and I always talk about here is don't pay a bunch of money for the, the mortgage, do a zero point or zero cost loan, do the 15% down and put yourself into a position to benefit uh, later on if, if rates are to slide down and your equity goes higher after you've made the improvements to the home. No, absolutely good stuff. That was uh, that was good stuff about the uh, the MI there, and, and understand. I mean, hell, people that put ten percent down last year on a house now have twenty percent equity in a lot of markets. I mean, here in Southern California, I mean, those people. I mean, home prices went up by more than ten percent in a lot of these areas, and so now those people were able to remove that MI. So you know, you can leverage yourself a little bit in 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 these situations. And for well qualified borrowers, people don't know on conventional loans, your mortgage insurance rate varies by your qualifications. If you have an 800 credit score, it's better than a 780 for MI and it's better than a 760 and it's much better than a 700. Another thing, if there's two borrowers, because again, there's less risk if we have two borrowers with two incomes, they, they're looking, the insurance, mortgage insurance company is looking at the overall level of risk. But long way of saying, those clients that we closed today, their mortgage insurance was 0.12%. So it was almost nothing for him to not have to bring twelve dollars or $15,000 in uh, at closing. And be, be aware of that. Get the numbers in writing. If you're thinking of two numbers, whoever you're talking to, Carl, um, with your financing, have them show it to you side by side. Have them show you what 80% looks like. Have them show what, uh, what 75 or 85% uh, looks like like and see the difference with the mortgage insurance. You'd probably be surprised how small the difference is and how that extra money is going to allow you to fix up the, the home. Awesome. All right. So Trisha's asking about how to find a mortgage broker. The easiest way to do that is just to email me. Um, you know, I'll throw my email there at the end. If you comment on the video, I'll put it in there as well. Uh, but we actually have a great mortgage broker in Chicago or in Illinois. I'm not sure if she's in Chicago or not, but she is. Um, yeah, I, I sent her a ton of people. Um, and, and so happy to, to put you in touch with her is the easiest answer to that question. Um, so email me or Josh and we'll get you hooked up. Uh, what are some parts of SoCal that are booming that are great for first time home buyers? Uh, you know, it depends on what you're looking for, right? I mean, Southern California is, um, pretty diverse in, in depending on where you are, right? I mean, you can, a lot of people consider Southern California anywhere from what South of LA all the way out into Palm Springs could be, you know, considered Southern California to some people. So, um, you know, it just depends on what you're looking for and your price point. Uh, you know, it, it's a hard question to really answer. Um, you know, in our market for the longest time in Orange County, um, where I am, you know, not necessarily say for first time home buyers, but great markets are those markets that are are finally starting to get, you know, kind of regentrified, if you will. They're starting to turn over. A lot of the older apartment buildings are starting to become you know, these infill developments of, of new construction and that sort of thing. When you see a lot of building, revamping, 
Um, those are areas that are likely going to have some sort of appreciation at some point. I mean, for the longest time, what West Side Costa Mesa was was you know the kind of a hidden gem. Um, and it's slowly starting to turn over and it's still in the process of doing that. It's probably going to be another 10 years before you really um, see major impact in there. But I mean, a lot of those properties have been, pre uh, you know, appreciated like crazy. Um, so it, it, it depends on what you're looking for. I don't know if you have anything to add to that. Um, the, what I would say, is it's almost hard to say uh, what, what would be great for first time buyer and a booming area. The problem is everything that's affordable low priced is, is getting bid up. Right. So you're paying big prices for it. It's hard for first time buyers. What I tell everyone is you got to look at the market. You got to do your analysis and be comfortable that two, three years from now, values are going to be higher. What looks really high right now, um, you know, with, with three years of 4% appreciation looks like a really good number. Rates are really low. If you can afford the monthly payment, you almost have to bite the bullet and accept that you're overpaying in the short term, but with the lack of supply, those prices are, are going to go up. So I wish we had, you know, better advice that there's some, some secret area that other people right. aren't aware of, but there's so many people out in the market that everything's getting pushed up. And, and like you're saying, previously terrible areas are, are turning over, you know, city of Compton was, was famous for gang wars and NWA. And now we have a lot of buyers buying over in Compton, buying homes over $500,000, you know, and if you're buying a $500,000 home, you're not a low income person. These are, are professionals moving into the area and you're seeing it in, in all sorts of, of cities. Yeah. And, and more so with what I said earlier, now you've got people willing to go to areas that they wouldn't consider before just because they no longer are tied to certain jobs, certain, um, driving in and, and commutes and what have you. So people are, are getting, you know, they're, they're willing to, to, to buy inland or, you know, so all of these markets that were once more affordable now really aren't quite as much just because there's so many people moving out to them. So, um, so Melanie is asking about being a first time home buyer, high credit score, no debt, uh, thoughts on going FHA or conventional? I mean, I think it comes down to down payment is essentially what it would come down to, right, Josh? Yeah, and what I always tell people is is numbers never lie. So the best thing we can do is lay down terms on a 3.5% down FHA and a three if it's a standard balance. So if it's under the 544, where I haven't memorized our new number yet this year, if it's under the 544, you can do 3% on a conventional. Otherwise, you're looking at a 5%. So we want to put those side by side. Um, generally, when we do that analysis, anyone with a credit score 720 and below is better off with the FHA, but we still always run the numbers. I don't ever want anyone to accept my word and just go, oh, trust me, you want to go FHA. We want to lay them down side by side. Um, there's Generally, FHA gets a bad rap um, during the Obama administration post bubble. Um, they made the mortgage insurance permanent. So people freaked out. They're like, well, I don't want FHA because the mortgage insurance is permanent. What people don't realize is it was on there previously until the mortgage got to 78% of the original balance. So to get to that point, it's 11 years. Most people don't stay in an FHA mortgage or in a single property for 11 years. They refinance out of it. So it's really a non-issue that that's what people see as the biggest problem. Um, there's some other pros and cons to FHA. When I have that conversation with borrowers, we talk about with the three and a half percent down FHA, yes, you put that down, but the way they do mortgage insurance is you finance a 1.75% upfront mortgage insurance premium. So it's in essence is like only putting 1.75% down. That's what your loan looks like on there. And then you have 0.85% mortgage insurance. For most buyers, especially first time buyers, they're looking at two things. How much cash does it take to get into the property? And what's my monthly payment? Nine times out of 10, and probably 10 times out of 10 for anyone with a credit score under 720, you're going to get in with less money and you're going to have a lower payment FHA. Now, you're saying you have a high credit score, no debt. Conventional may be the, the option for you because you could have a lower mortgage insurance rate that the higher, uh, the higher interest rate is offset by lower mortgage insurance, and you don't have to pay the upfront mortgage insurance premium. So again, numbers never lie. Let's pencil them out side by side and help you determine which one's better for you. No, uh, good stuff. So uh, Shelly, buying a primary using conventional 2.75, thinking about putting down just 5% with PMI. Do you think we should put 20% down to remove PMI or keep the extra money to invest? You know, I would say put the money down if you have it, keep the payment low, not have to pay the PMI. But uh, Josh, professional opinion on that. 
I, I lean more the opposite direction, and there's a lot here. In this context, we can only get so much info from, from Shelly. Now, if 20% is every dollar they have and it's tied okay, up yeah, in the home, don't do I, I, don't, I don't like that at all. So maybe you go to the middle ground with like 10%. It also depends on how high the credit scores are. Again, with a 760 credit score and two borrowers, with a 10% down, the mortgage insurance is going to be so minimal that I would probably rather do that and have 10% still there in terms of reserves. What I also tell people is you need to know yourself. I have a client that we've done four or five refinances for. This guy makes $300,000 a year. Every time he comes back, he's maxed out like eight credit cards and he wants to do cash out and pay off his credit cards. So the last time we finally just put him into a 15 year mortgage because he could qualify for it. He had all the income. So what we said for you is we know that if you have spare money, you go spend it. So all I, all I like to say is know yourself. If you know that you're going to spend the 20% down if it's not in your house, put it in there, put it in that lockbox and keep it there. If you have discipline and you're a, uh, an established investor that you're comfortable, whether it's in your 401k or in some type of investment vehicle where you can invest it, I, I would kind of look at splitting the difference. You know, uh, even 10 or 15% down keeps some of your money back and lowers that mortgage insurance to, to a respectable level. And again, to not keep beating a dead horse, but the numbers never lie. Pencil, pencil them all out. Look at the side-by-side -side comparison of 5, 10, 15, and 20% down and what the cash to close is and what your comfort level is with how much that leaves for you and what you would be likely to do with it. No, awesome. Good stuff. Uh, let's see here. Uh, go down to Eric here. So what happens during 10 contingency period when the seller does not send their disclosure? I'm not sure what 10 contingency period. So a 10 day contingency period. Yeah. Um, what happens during the 10 day contingency period when the seller does not send their disclosure? Well, you could do one of things, right? You could send them a notice to perform um, as a buyer. Um, and but that could come back to bite you, right? If they don't send it within, you know, the next 48 hours, depending on what you have um, specified in the contract, assuming you have that as part of your contract here in California, we have, you know, you part of the RPA is that you know, there's a, an item in there that addresses this notice to perform, which essentially gives both buyers and sellers an opportunity to present a document. And if the seller or the buyer does not do what that document's asking um, within a specified period of time, both can back out essentially of, of the transaction, right? Um, with Without losing deposits and that sort of thing, depending on how it's it's worded. So, you know, it, it it's really one it's, it can bite you. Um, so I would, if I was an agent representing a buyer and the seller didn't have it, I would just continue to work with, with the, the, the listing agent as, as your agent and try to get those documents. Um, other than that, you know, it's part of the contract. It has to be provided. Keep, keep this in mind. You don't have to release your contingencies until you have that document. So what do you care? Just continue to drag out your contingencies, um, as a buyer and, and you win, right? I mean, you could go all the way up to the end of the transaction, have your loan approved, have the appraisal done, have the home inspection completed, all of that, and never release your contingencies because you don't have the seller disclosures. At the end of the day, they have to provide them per the contract in order to close. So it, it could actually benefit you in some, some ways. But if you're one of those people that really wants it right now and, and you're going to um, you know, not do anything until you have them, you're not going to proceed with anything, then you either got to wait or, or send a notice to perform. So, all right. So Shelly, of course she lost service. Thanks guys. So it, it is, it is on there. If you want to see it, this will be out there. You can watch it and replay it. You're at the, like the 40 something minute mark, Shelly, if you wanted to, to touch in, um, can I get a, can I partner with someone if they're using an FHA loan on a duplex and I'm just on title, even though I have my own FHA. So yeah, you can have a non occupying co-borrower on FHA. Um, Thoughts on that, Josh? You just want to jump on there? It's a little bit of a complex question because I'm reading through it and trying yeah. to parse it out. He says, I'm on, I'm just on the title, even though I have my own FHA. So if he's in his own FHA home, he can be a non-occupying co-borrower for someone else because that person is the owner, occupant borrower, and he is just co-signing for them. You, you got to be careful when you say, can I partner with someone? It doesn't sound like it's necessarily a family member. Um, FHA has a very short list of acceptable relationships for, for co-borrowers, um, but 
if it falls within that context, you should be fine. Just be really careful that if they, if an underwriter looks at it and feels as though you're really just investing with a partner in another property, they can decline the loan. It's one of those situations where it's a gray area. I think you would be much better off getting a complete package in with a lender and even getting it in front of an underwriter and getting a, a TBD approval, which means your loan is approved subject to just getting a purchase contract and appraisal and, and prelim for a property that you get under contract. Right. Good stuff. Um, is there a way to avoid PMI with less than 20% down? You could go VA if you're a veteran. Um, <laughs> there's, there's, there's no, there's no MI there. Uh, but I mean, Josh can jump on this too, but I mean, essentially you can, there are rates, you can pay a higher rate and the MI is built in to the rate. I think those are still probably out there somewhere that are doing those, but either way you're paying for it, right? You're either paying for it in a rate or you're paying for it monthly. So no is the answer other than VA. Um, Abraham. So we're going to wrap this up here in, in a minute, Josh. We'll take a couple more. No FHA, no VA, no conventional loan? Question mark. Just save money and buy a house in full or do conventional lagoon be the best? I want to save as much as possible. So I think what he's saying is don't do FHA, don't do VA, don't do a conventional, just buy the house in cash. You know, in Southern California, it's tough <laughs> to do that. When it's the, difficult. Uh, when the you know the median home price in in Southern California is I don't know what the number was this year seven hundred and twelve thousand or something absurd uh, might even be higher than that so yeah that that's that's difficult advice to follow it's it's great if you have the cash I think it's great advice if you have the cash but you know actually maybe not because you could leverage a lot now with really low rates so um, Nigel's asking what states do you tend to gravitate more to when wholesaling deals. Don't don't do wholesaling here. Um, so, you know, it would have to be California if I was doing it because th that would be the majority of it. But other than that, not really doing wholesaling. Yep. Um, all right, guys. So, yeah, that, that's pretty much it there. I think we we, we address most of them. If you're watching this afterward, and you still have questions, you know, leave them there. We'll we'll definitely address them in, in the next live that we do. Um, you know, we always appreciate you guys taking the time to watch. If you haven't done so already, subscribe, hit that like button. Um, and you know, if you have questions about real estate, about loans, email me. Um, we can throw the information up here, Josh. I don't know where it is. <laughs> <laughs> I usually have it. There we go. I usually there have we go. There's two email there. addresses. They're actually backwards, but it, it nevertheless, it's all the same. Um, and and again, you know, a lot of you guys have reached out. I, I always respond um, if I have the answer or not. If not, I'm putting you in touch with the people that do, and I'm happy to continue doing that. Um, because I appreciate the support you guys have given and uh, you guys are continuing to show up. So thank you for that. Any final parting words there, Josh? No, I would just let everyone know that um, although we're local to California, we both have really extensive uh, expert networks. My business partner and I are actually building out a website that is an expert network where you can find someone local to you. Um, we'll have that up and running here in the next three to six months. But uh, Jeb also has a huge network of, of realtors from around the country that are true vetted experts. Um, and, and if any advice I have for anyone is... I get it. Um, your cousin just got his license and he's going to give you half the commission or your neighbor just started doing loans on the side and they're going to give you a deal. Uh, we have a bunch of uh, clients that are, that are police and fire and someone at the fire station has always started doing loans on the side and wants to do a great deal for them. And then we hear the horror stories of how it works on the back end. Uh, we don't want me going out and fighting fires. We don't want the guy at the firehouse doing your loan. Nothing against them and nothing against my firefighting skills. But the most important thing you can do is have a, a professional on your side. No, absolutely. And and that, that that take that anywhere you want. That could be going to the doctor, the dentist, too. I mean, you want a professional, not just in real estate and mortgage. So uh, but anyway, guys, that's enough from us. Appreciate you guys taking the time to watch and we will see you again next week. Adios. Yeah.